Thank you for downloading this episode of In Our Time. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk slash radio4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello, quote, one is not born but rather becomes a woman, end of quote. So wrote Simone de Beauvoir in her best-known and most influential work, The Second Sex, her exploration of what it means to be a woman in a world defined by men. Published in 1949, it was an immediate success with thousands of women who bought it, much less so with some of the male critics. Beauvoir was born in France in 1908 to a high bourgeois family, and some commentators say that it was her good fortune that her father lost his fortune when she was a girl. With no dowry, she pursued her education to get work, and in a key exam to allow her to teach philosophy came second only to Jean-Paul Sartre. He was retaking it. They became lovers and for the rest of their lives together intellectual sparring partners. Sartre concentrated on existentialist philosophy. Beauvoir explored that and existential Essex, plus she wrote the novel, the most successful was The Mandarins, and increasingly, in the decades up to her death in 1986, she wrote about the situation of women in the world. With me to discuss Simone de Beauvoir are Christina Howells, Professor of French and Fellow of Wadham College at the University of Oxford, Margaret Atak, Professor of French at the University of Leeds, and Ursula Tidd, Professor of Modern French Literature and Thought at the University of Manchester. Christina Howells, can you give us something of Beauvoir's family background? Yes, well, as you say, she had a bourgeois background, um, quite a conventional family, younger sister, who she was extremely fond of, Poupette. Um, Her mother was apparently a religious woman, and seems to have dominated in that sense because Beauvoir went to a religious school. Um, She discovered, she says... Catholic. Catholic school, yes, indeed, Catholic school. Corps des Irs, she calls it. Um, She says in her autobiography that when she was 14, she discovered that she was, in fact, an atheist. That seems to me very French because in England we're not so fussed about whether we're atheists (laughs) or not (laughs) with our general... Church of England backgrounds, but in France it's very important. So it's quite conflictual to be a non-believer with a religious mother. Um, She was obviously an extremely clever child, and she was very successful in her exam. She she studied at school, she studied in particular literature and mathematics. So, although of course all the French do philosophy for quite a while, right through to to leaving, Um, but she moved into philosophy um, when she went to university. And which, we're talking about a time when women couldn't get to the top university, they couldn't get to Ecole Normale, they couldn't have the vote, they couldn't do all sorts of things. Which university did she get to and uh, Mm. how successful was she there? Yes, well, it's it's an interesting um, story, really. She went to the Sorbonne, but she seems to have managed to follow classes at the Ecole Normale. Which was the top place? Yes. Men, Men only? Men only, yes, men only, um, where students were prepared for the agrégation, this very competitive French exam, which um, after which one was allowed to teach in school or if one was more lucky in university, um, if you pursued further. And she didn't go to the preparatory classes called Cagne. She didn't go to the two or three years of preparation for getting into the École Normale. She wasn't allowed to go there officially. She went there unofficially. And she she had a really stupendous um, academic uh, record, I would say. Um, as you said yourself, she came second to Sartre when she took the Agagessian venture. This is in the whole country. That's right. She was 21, he was 24, and he'd sat it before, although um, why he failed first time round is probably for another programme. <laughs> <laughs> and indeed, I read the... Um, I read recently... Um, the report that one of the examiners had written on that year's intake for the agrégation. And he doesn't name Beauvoir and Sartre, but he says two students stood out, were extraordinary. He said the rest were really rather mediocre. <laughs> yeah. So they, he was fascinated by her, this young, very attractive woman, 20, 21, mm-hmm. as brilliant as that, and she was in, slightly in awe of him, and yeah. they got cracking then and there, really, didn't they? I think that's right, yes. She, she has various accounts of it. Um, 
it, it seems that he was fascinated by I mean, he was a very ugly man and she was very lovely, so it's not surprising. And they were both so intelligent. I know she, she always claimed that Sartre was superior, but I think that was very modest of her. In fact, bizarrely modest, given the, what she's done later. But she made, uh, retrospectively, I think, but still a statement, I knew that my life would be part of his life for the rest of my life. Yes, she did. It's hard to know, isn't it? Because we probably all feel a bit like that. <laughs> <laughs> Move on rather quickly here. <laughs> Margaret, Margaret Atak, <clears throat> how did Beauvoir's romantic relationship with Sartre develop and what did it bring in its train in terms of philosophy? Well, it was certainly a lifelong emotional commitment, a very uh, unconventional one in many ways. It, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, it was an open relationship. They had lots of other relationships. They didn't set up in a kind of domestic unit. They never but married. From, they never married. Um, so this is very, very unconventional in, for, for its time and for her background. Um, but I think... He he was as dazzled by her intellect as he was by her looks. It when she was invited to come and join in the for the preparation of the of the oral for the um, for for the aggregation, and um, and she had studied Leibniz. She'd done a little thing on Leibniz, so she came and gave them a little lesson. Well, probably a big lesson on Leibniz. So they started within philosophy and within ideas and they both wanted to be writers so I think it was a huge meeting of minds as well as a a, a, a very loving as one sees from the letters and from her autobiography uh, a very loving and affectionate and intimate relationship um, so she certainly wasn't interested in becoming um, a creator of philosophical systems in the way that he was. But I don't... I mean, she was always within philosophy. But um, she said, I, you know, I don't have to invent a philosophical system to feel myself Sartre's equal or, or, or independent. It's very attractive, isn't it? These two people of supreme intelligence meeting each other and you just imagine them sitting in the Dermago or Café Floor across the, <laughs> across the Boulevard Saint-Germain talking philosophy all the time. It's terrific, isn't it? Was yes. it like that? Well, I think there was a lot of... I think there was a lot of philosophy, yes, and there was a lot of gossip. They loved gossip. Yes. They, they had open relationships, so they had a little group of people and they talked talked a lot about each other and uh, so her letters are often full of kind of what's the gossip in what's the gossip going and, and catching up and so they were very interested in people in fact Sartre always used to say that uh, um, men men were less interested in people in his entourage than women so I think they had a they had a very kind of strong philosophical psychological yeah we know but the gossip's great we might get more yeah. like it but actually tell us about the philo they really did talk about philosophy in these places so they did talk we about want to know that <laughs> <laughs> so they did talk about philosophy and so she certainly was working within the importance of um, his apprehension of being in the world, of the existentialist framework, of freedom, of choice, of commitment and um, all their works were jointly kind of almost edited. She used to send him her manuscripts, he used to send him his. So her elaboration of the... Um, uh, the nature of self and other, interaction with other people, interaction with the world, interaction with the major social issues of the day. They were both, they were both very involved in that. There was a feeling around, I mean, from teenagers at, 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 around the time my, myself, that somehow that was a centre of, of the world thought where you talked your way to thinking and like it was, ha as it was happening nowhere else in the world. Now, this is nonsense, but there was a feeling that, that there was some truth in it. That you talked your way to thinking. Uh, yes. She worked her way to thinking as well. Right. She she was somebody who spent a long time in libraries. Who command. She had a fantastic um, uh, ability to uh, assimilate detail on a vast scale. She was very erudite, actually, as well as <laughs> as well as talking her way through and and that, uh, all those exchanges. Yeah. Ursula uh, did. Beauvoir, she saw herself primarily as a writer. Mm -hmm. Is that is that correct? I mean, we're talking about her and Sartre, and we'll talk more about it about yes. their philosophy. But she began uh, it, with with a wartime book. She came to stay, and then another novel, The Blood of Others. Can you tell us about the? the, the she came to stay first of all. Yes, of course. Okay, so um, she came to stay, or L'Invité, as it's known in French, was published in 1943. It's Beauvoir's first published novel, and in this novel, um, it's been described. I think Merleau-Ponty described it as a metaphysical novel. So it's a novel which explores 
um, in a sense, one of the grand themes of Beauvoir's um, intellectual life, which was really the whole theme of the other. So it's a metaphysical novel which explores the problem of the other. Um, but Can you it's explain also, what she meant by the other? Yes, OK. So it's really looking at um, how um, what happens when we realise that there are other people in the world and how we respond to other people in the world and how I cannot know who I am in the world unless I fully engage with others in the world and um, understand what it is to be with others in the world. I mean, one of Beauvoir's... Uh, philosophical concepts that she will go on to discuss later is the notion of the existential situation. Um, and the other, or other people, are part of our existential situation. So we might adopt all sorts of attitudes towards other people, um, but they are still part of our lives. So Beauvoir in this novel is exploring what it is to really begin to take into account the presence of the other and she explores it through a triadic relationship which is loosely based on some of the relationships that she was having On her and Sartre and one of Sartre's That's right, other with women. Olga Kosekiewicz yes. which was a triadic relationship they had in the 1930s um, one can read it as a novel around uh, of personal relationships and how um, uh, Françoise uh, gradually comes to um, into relationship with Xavier, um, but she's it's it's really about the terror of the other, really, and of course the metaphysical problem of the other is not solved in She Came to Stay because, and here's a spoiler for anybody who hasn't read it yet, because of course Françoise uh, kills Xavier the young woman who she and Pierre invite into their life at the end of the novel. So in a sense, Beauvoir is broaching the problem of the other in this first metaphysical novel. And then killing it off. And <laughs> killing it off, yes, indeed. Yes. A bit, that's a bit uh, flip of me. But, well, uh, let's <laughs> talk about the, the second one, The Blood of Others, yes. at the end of the, uh, two or three years later. And that's right. The yes. next novel. Yes, so The Blood of what Others... What kind of war did Beauvoir have? OK, so The Blood of Others is very much a product of Beauvoir's wartime experience. It's published in 1945. It was hailed by Camus on publication as a fraternal novel and the first resistance novel. Um, and in this novel, Beauvoir is exploring, um, again, the... Um, presence of the other but in the context of situated action so it's centred on essentially two main characters, Jean Blumard who's a resistance leader and much of the action takes place in the context of World War II and one of the kind of main decisions that opens the novel is Jean Blumard trying to decide whether or not to sanction um, actions of sabotage against uh, the Nazis during, you know, in occupied Paris um, and really, it's a whole novel about the ethics of responsibility and the ethics of action. The epigraph to the novel, the little pithy phrase that opens it, is taken from Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov. And the quote is, and it kind of sums the novel up a little bit, which is why I'm citing it here. And the quote is, each of us is responsible to everyone and for everything. OK, which is, of course, a ter terribly tall order. OK, <laughs> but in a sense, Beauvoir is working this out and she's working it out through the 1940s. That is to say, the parameters of our individual freedom and our collective freedom. Is she in any way part of the resistance that we can we, we can take account of? Um, Beauvoir and Sartre are not formally part of the, the kind of constituted resistance. Um, they travel down south during, during World War II to try and set up a resistance group called Socialisme et Liberté, Socialism and Freedom. It didn't come to very much. Um, they were certainly um, acting in accordance with the, the, the code that was established for writers who were refusing to collaborate with the Vichy regime. Um, but no, not in the sense of being actively, you know, involved in resistance cells and, you know, blowing bridges up and that kind of thing. Christina Howells, um, Sartre and Beauvoir were existentialists and, and um, as has mentioned the word term uh, quite a bit. She published The Ethics of Ambiguity in just two years after the second novel. Uh, now, ambiguity and existentialism are not easy bedfellows, are they? Can you tell us why? Yes, I think it's, in a sense, ambiguity and ex existentialism might be okay together. It's ethics and existentialism, in, which is prob problematic. Ambiguity, I think, is a very strange word. 
uh, in this context. I was thinking about it before the programme. It hadn't really struck me before how odd it was. And I think that it's almost misleading um, in that ambiguity in the popular sense suggests perhaps something a little bit vague uh, that we're not certain of. Well, we're not certain of the ethics of existentialism, that's for sure. But I think it's more paradoxical, more complex, the ethics of complexity or the ethics of uh, existentialism. And the problem really is that for an existentialist trying to compose an ethics, the problem really is that for existentialism, there are no pre-given values, just as there are no pre-given characters. You construct your character, you construct your gender indeed, as we'll see a bit, bit later. You also construct your morality. Now, in common this sense... Is what it, this is the existentialist creed. Yes, yes. yes. So in you make yourself as you become. You make yourself, but you also make your ethics. So in common sense, we might think that we know roughly what's good and what's bad. We mustn't steal, we mustn't hit people, we mustn't kill people. That's common sense. Also, if you are a more rigorous philosopher, say a Kantian philosopher, then there are also categorical imperatives, things which definitely are always wrong, such as lying or killing. Now, for the existentialist, it's situational. It, what are the consequences of this behaviour? So in a certain situation, you can lie and it's OK? Yes, you can lie and it's OK. You can kill and it's OK. Um, if ultimately um, something important is being achieved. It's the question of means and ends. And of course, for them, for Sartre and Beauvoir too, for Beauvoir it's a very big question, means and ends. It's not simply that the end justifies the means. That could lead to anything. Uh, the means can contaminate the end. So um, I think that it's an ethics of complexity. It's an attempt to work through well, issues such as those that Ursula was describing in the novels, issues about how to deal with other people what to do in a wartime situation where if you kill, for example, if you kill one of the uh, occupiers, there may be reprisals. Lots of people may be killed because of, of that. So how you make your decisions is at the heart of existential ethics. And I think that's why Sarge doesn't uh, compose one or publish one, mm. but Beauvoir does. Yes, I'd also like to say something about violence as well, mm. because um, it's certainly true that there are no universal moral precepts in existentialism, but I think also Beauvoir does make it quite clear that resort to violence, either sort of you know, psychological or, or physical violence, is always a moral failure, OK? And I think this is why, in her existentialist ethics, she, she's very concerned to tease out all sorts of complex situations, because it's the devil... Forgive, the, the devil is in the detail and it's looking at the precise context of action that is really important. The, prob the problem might be that, that, that the idea of existentialism <coughs> is total liberty mm. and the idea of ethics is constraints. Existentialism is total liberty. I think maybe not. I think existentialism... I may, yes, yeah. I think existentialism is about choosing and you are free to make your choices, but it's not unconstrained, it's constrained by its consequences. And its consequences are the kind of person you become and the kind of world that you create through your behaviour. Margaret, I, I, Margaret I would Aitra. add also that it's also the, um, the complexity of never having a good conscience. Mm. You can never, within an existentialist perspective, sit back and tick it off and say, well, then I'm a good, authentic person. Mm. Because of the nature that they construct action as a result of freedom, you can never, you can never get off the treadmill of choosing, of making choices, and it is the choices which obviously are bringing your values into the world. The choices are eloquent of your values. So you're always on this treadmill. You can never stop. So the ambiguity is, that, is, is also um, that, yes, you go for action, but you can never go with a quiet conscience. You can never think, oh, well, that's it, and I've ticked it, and I've done it, because you're always going to be doing damage in some parts of the world. You can never have clean hands. So it, may, it puts a huge responsibility on you to work out consequences, which, as Christina said, could go on and on and on. People who react to what you do, and they react to the action of what you do. And so there's but a stage in which you can't do anything at all. You're scared to do. No, because you're free. And if you decide to kind of sit yourself on, on being scared stiff and stopping, well, that is a choice that you are freely making right. so that you can always, as long as you're alive, your life is always a life of freedom and choice and you can reorientate it. It's only when the final curtain goes down that it becomes... Can I stay with you to talk about the, sec to begin the discussion about the second sex? What's the big idea in that book? 
So the second sex is often boiled down to two big ideas. You quoted, you quoted one of them, that gender is constructed, the identity is constructed, and the other big idea is really dismantling this, um, the operation and the dynamic of woman as other. Can we just start about gender is constructed? What do you mean by that? It's constructed. What did, what did Beauvoir mean she, by that? She meant that existentialism, we have no nature, we have no human nature, we are free, we are totally not determined. So that there is a kind of philosophical rejection from the outset, gut rejection, of the idea that there might be an eternel féminin, as the French call it, and, you know, just like a woman, and a female identity. So that our, we do not have gendered natures in the same we don't have any kind of nature so, so we have no nature at all nothing from our parents nothing from the environment nothing from the work situation nothing from the imperatives of our life there's no, no nothing there at all not in terms of something that you can say this is why i act as i do it's because of my background it's because of my gender it's because of my nationality i'm acting in accordance with um a pre-given script and for Beauvoir and Sartre, there are no pre-given scripts. They are. Um, he, he, it was once existential was once described as taking all logical consequences from atheism. So if there's no God, humanity, we are just born and we are there, and it is our being um, the nature of consciousness and action that means that we will construct our path through the world. But sorry to be lumping about this. That's OK for de Beauvoir and, and, and Sartre sitting in the Deux go in Paris with a nice job doing philosophers and so on. But somebody born into a family where they... they poor family, but they have to earn a living and they have to, as it were, let's say, let's take it to a bit of an extreme, go down the mines because it's the only work they can do. There's a lot prescribed for them. And for women, brought up, they have to go into domestic service, earn a living. And, there's a lot prescribed, isn't there? Absolutely, and so, so that is the kind of choice. those are the those are the kind of givens of one's situations. As you said, it's always in situation. Being is not an is not a free floating autonomous thing. So it's what you do with the cards that you've been dealt. Oh, sure. Do you want to take this on? Um, yes. I mean, it is. It is about the situation. Um, I think also. I think your point is really well well made, Melbourne. I think. I think one. Of course, if one's basic needs haven't been met in life, you're not going to be starting to think about the meaning of existence. That's quite true. Um, but uh, Beauvoir's. <laughs> is encouraging women in the second sex to throw themselves into the world, to use a slightly Heideggerian <laughs> phrase, and to seize their lives and to make their essence. So in a sense, when she's talking about not about becoming woman and not being born a woman, um, her point really is an anti-naturalist one, that there is no inherent nature that decrees that men are like this and women are like that. I completely understand that. It's not okay. having the choices. It's, it's that the people can make all the choices. I don't, I don't go along with it. But you can. You, so you're born, and, and it is society, the patriarchy, which says you have to be like that because you're a female. That's right. It's uh, patriarchal ideology. Yes. Okay. Um, so patriarchal ideology has certain what Beauvoir would call, the French would call, myths about women. Okay. There are also myths about men, but Beauvoir is interested in women, and those myths are act as determining forces for women in the world, Such which. As constrain them to behave in certain ways. Well, for example, the myth of motherhood, that motherhood is a natural situation that all women are destined to fulfil. Beauvoir argues controversially in The Second Sex that there is no maternal instinct and that the experience of real mothers on the ground, if I can put it in that way, um, is terribly variable. Um, in the same way that one could argue the experience of paternity is terribly variable as well. And this has to be learned rather than... Exactly, and this is something that in the second volume of The Second Sex, which is subtitled Lived Experience, indicating the phenomenological emphasis of the second volume, um, Beauvoir is uh, at pains to show the micropolitics of gender relations and the ways in which girls and women learn very quickly, both at conscious and unconscious levels, how to become women which can, who conform to patriarchal ideology. So they become the second sex, the, the, the moon to the sun and the, the dark they to the light. They so. become relative yes. to the masculine universal subject. That's right. That's that what the second sex is. And so that determines their, their lives, the sexuality, everything about them. Well, it doesn't necessarily. <laughs> um, so Beauvoir's task is to dismantle some of these myths right. in the second sex and... Uh, in the second volume, she's saying, well, if we, look at, if we look at women's real experience, women are not predetermined in that way. 
okay, that women do have choices. And it's also up to women to seize those choices. Um, because, and this is another kind of controversial area of the second sex, but why doesn't let women off the hook either? She looks at various ways that women respond to that situation. And sometimes p women are complicit with patriarchal ideology. How is this received, Christina? Christina Howells. Ah, well, it has a very mixed reception, and um, I just wanted to add something <coughs> to, to what Ursula just said, because I think that Beauvoir herself reinterprets the second sex later. So, um, for example, she says, people, there was an outcry because people said, I denied the maternal instinct. Of mm. course I didn't, she said. But indeed, she does appear to be doing so when, she, when she's writing. Uh, later on, she, she, she says that she would have written things in a more Marxist way later. I think that... What did she mean by that? I think she would have looked more at structures, she would have looked perhaps not at such individual psychology of women incorporating and internalising um, male values, but seeing it in a more structural way rather than an individual way. So the French have an idea that equality and di difference yeah. between, that there can be equality between men and women mm -hmm. and a sort of... Um, substantial and uh, livable with difference. But yes. she was for equality, is that right? She was for equality. Uh, you, you asked me uh, um, how it was received. Yes. Well, it was received differently in different countries, differently, obviously, by different people. It was very popular. It seems to have been seen to be rather rude, in fact. And um, Beauvoir says that um, Moriac actually was very indignant and said that he didn't wish to know about the uh, workings of the author's vagina which um, caused quite uh, a, a scandalous um, reaction. I think that Beauvoir is quite explicit about bodily functions. So she talks about menstruation, for example, and abortion. Um, and what she writes is quite distasteful, I think, to... to uh, well, maybe it doesn't... Maybe my <laughs> colleagues don't find it distasteful, but she says, you know, that women smell and women get constipated, all to do with menstruation. It's quite extraordinary. It seems very old-fashioned now. But at the time, it was really rather revolutionary to be talking about it at all. Similarly, I think that something else that wasn't liked in this book was the way in which she... Um, talks about women without really talking about femininity. So she, particularly the Americans, found this difficult to deal with. They thought that you could be a feminist and feminine. But whereas Beauvoir's equality feminism wants, I would say, to move away from femininity. Can you take take this on, Margaret? Ed? <coughs> Sorry, can you take this on, Margaret? Ed? Like this, her idea of, of feminism and herself as a feminist... Well, uh, certainly the, the, the work and the writing for the second sex was a huge feminist statement. Whether she would have said in the 30s that she was a feminist would be very unlikely. She, like South, were not very interested in politics. They were very much more interested in themselves. But after, after the war, after the transition they went through in the war, she became much more interested in, in the rootedness of experience. And so the rootedness of women's experience and the discovery of the disparagement and the oppression and the inequality uh, and, uh, and the systematic denigration of the female in this gender relationship between the sexes, I think so that's a huge, hugely feminist. Personally, I find her works are never hostile to women, but that's not a wide... <laughs> It's widely, widely shared in some circles. But I, I certainly don't find her at all hostile to women and women hating. I find she explores... Um, so her work I would certainly describe as women-centred in the way it explores in depth um, dilemmas of characters in all sorts of lived experiences, of, of including motherhood, marriage, um, writers, intellectuals, but not only. Um, and, and clearly, after 68, when the women's movement exploded across Europe and the States, she was a major figurehead, and she took that on with great energy and enthusiasm. She worked with the Minister for Women's Rights in the 80s, defending her laws when um, Yvette Roudy tried to bring in a law um, restricting, uh, denigrating images of women in public. She was held down. She received a vitriolic reaction for that measure, and Beauvoir was very marked in her defence. But even 
even earlier, I think she was very comfortable um, with defending women in the in the Algerian war. She supported a well-known lawyer, Giselle Alimi, who was working for um, Algerians who were being imprisoned and tortured. And she also um, co-authored books to support Algerian women during the Algerian war. So I think feminism and women-centeredness is politically and intellectually very central to her work. Is there more to add, Ursula? As it did to how far she influenced feminist ideas, particularly this second breath, as it were, in the 60s when it got tremendously underway yes. in America and here. And can you just take that on? Yes, absolutely. That, please? Yes. So Beauvoir was approached um, in the kind of flurry of radical activity around May 68. Beauvoir was approached by, by young feminists, young Marxist feminists such as Christine Delphi and, and others. And they wanted Beauvoir, Beauvoir was of course now in her 60s, and they wanted Beauvoir to lend her support, as Margaret has said, to um, this new second wave of feminist activity in France. And Beauvoir, Beauvoir, I think in many ways, was, was very humble as an intellectual. She could have played the grand, the, the sort of grand dame of, of, you know, French letters, but she didn't do that. And she lent her support in a very discreet way. She financed uh, financed uh, sort of political campaigns. She lent her support to the campaign for legalising abortion in France, which was passed in 1975. So she was very hands-on, but I think in a very discreet way. And I think that was very much appreciated by, you know, young feminists who needed that kind of support to get some of these campaigns off the ground. Christi- <coughs> Christina Howells, um, she, you mentioned very early on that she often, on one of you did, that she slightly resisted the idea of being thought of as a philosopher, certainly not an equal of Sartre in that area of her life. What, what do, does that matter? What does that, how do you react to that? I think she certainly was a philosopher. She didn't really write many philosophical treaties. I suppose the ethics of ambiguity was a philosophical treatise. Otherwise, it was primarily through novels um, and her autobiography, of course. But these are very philosophical works, deeply philosophical works, and because existentialism is based on human existence and the problems all come back to the human rather than anything to do with perhaps logic or analysis of a more abstract kind, novels and plays might well be, and were for Sartre as well, the best way of expressing the existential philosophy. So you can analyse it or you can show it. And I think that Beauvoir showed it. And the discussions that you find within the novels, within the fiction, are profoundly philosophical. I think that they would not be any more um, clear or any more probing if they'd been written analytically. So I think she was a philosopher. Does that take us to the <coughs> the Mandarins, a novel in uh, uh, 1954, it won the Prix Goncourt, Margaret Atek? It was hugely successful and hugely significant. I think it was a kind of perfect storm around this novel which uh, which uh, projected it forward. Um, she was extremely notorious, from, <coughs> as uh, Christine has been saying, from the second sex. She was very well known. Existentialism had been flavour of the month. They were celebrities. They really were intellectual celebrities. So Gallimard promoted this as a, as a novel about people. Publisher. So the publisher. Mm. So um, I think there was a great interest in kind of getting the inside story of all the debates between them. But it's also taking on the relationships between France and America, the nature, the, the, the increasing domination and power of America, the relationships between the Communist Party and the intellectual left and the Soviet Union. So it's got hugely ambitious international themes and how they're playing out in France. It's got a whole group of intellectuals who are writing and it's set just in 44, 45 as they're coming out of the war. So it's set 10 years earlier as they're grappling with the uh, ambiguities of being committed politically in a world where it no longer seems so black and white as it had been in the resistance. Did it help or hinder it that there was quite a lot of people spotting went on? 
Uh, that's him, that's her, that's him, that's her. Well, she hated that. She really yeah, hated there, that. It? But I think, it, I mean, I'm sure it, incre- I'm sure it increased the reception so of it. Can you give us a flavour of that briskly, you, Margaret, or anyone? Well, it's a, I would, I, when I teach it, I tell the students it's a roman à clé, so perhaps that's very bad of me, but I think you can very clearly see who's who. There's Camus in it, Beauvoir in it, Sartre in it. Camus was very upset by it because the character Henri... Um, drives his wife insane in the book um, and of course Camus' first wife sadly did go to a, a mental asylum um, Henri is very promiscuous in the book that's also true of Camus so I think that there is a big correspondence um, if Beauvoir didn't like it then I think she'd put too thin a skin really on the <laughs> I think she's quite eloquent as to how different they are in terms yes. of Camus' politics was very different from Henri's politics and, uh, the, and the kind of alliance with communism is very different I, 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 of course, I yes. think she does um, I, don't, I don't think it was her idea Dear. Clearly, she's drawing on her experience. She says there's a lot of her and her relationship with the American writer Nelson Algren is part of the relationship between. He wasn't too keen on being portrayed there either, was he? No, but their correspondence did continue after that mm-hmm. for a long time. So they did remain in contact, and he was clearly a kind of really touchy individual as well but they really it really founded when she published her autobiography about their relationship that was what he certainly couldn't take at all I think with, with, with Beauvoir, it, it's also about her life was also the stuff of literature. So in a sense, you know, she lived to write and she, she wrote to, to live and, and everything does, you know, get witnessed in, in her writing. I think also just a quick word about, about the Mandarins as well that I'd like to add is, is that it's also about the politics of truth telling in the immediate Coast War, uh, Pol- uh, Cold War period in, in France. And one of the kind of central ethical dilemmas in that novel is whether to expose the existence of the Soviet gulags to the French left. Um, and that particular question is something that the um, character Henri Perron, who's this editor of L'Espoir, this um, sort of independent left-wing journal, has to agonise over in terms of whether to, you know, how to manage this information. I mean, Which it's, is angry, because it's letting, down, letting down the communist side exactly, by, by exactly, telling the truth. Exactly. It's always been a problem. Yes. <laughs> But it's also letting down the workers. It's letting down the, the uh, because of the importance of communism broadly mm. in French. It was the biggest party mm. in the elections after the Second World War. So it had huge legitimacy on the left generally. So it's a bit like the issues we were talking earlier. You can't you can't have a clean conscience. Whatever you do, you're going to do damage. Christina, can I come to you towards the end? But we've got a good a good handful of time. Um, the, the the autobiography, which right. you rate extremely highly, I do. and also the letters, which which rather slightly muddy the waters I between. Uh, I think we oughtn't to um, um, stall at that. So, can you tell us about the what you find as the uh, literary and philosophical virtues of the letters, and also the rather unsavoury things that you find in them? I see. Um, well. The autobiography and the letters are really very different. I, 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 before I talk about the letters, if I may, I'd like to say that you, you could see the autobiography as, a, as perhaps the pendant of the, the Mandarin. So whereas the Mandarin um, is a fiction in which there's a lot of her life, similarly, the autobiography is an account of her life in which there is a lot of fiction. Necessarily, the moulding, the stylizing, the omissions and the transformations. And... Um, I think that with an autobiography, it's very hard for her to get it absolutely... Well, it's hard for anyone to get anything absolutely right, but it's hard for her to get it right because she's uh, criticised both for having put two personal things into the autobiography by other people, such as Nelson Algren, didn't want their relationship to be described in such detail. But actually, if you're reading it, you may find, if you have a, a, a kind of slightly scurrilous interest in it, that you're constantly disappointed because she doesn't give you as much detail as you'd like about her relationships. Now, the letters are another... F- can we just stay with yeah. the autobiography for yeah. one more second? Yeah. Because you th- can you tell us why you think so particularly highly of them? Of the autobiography, yes. of the three volumes of yes. them, yes. I think it seems to me her most success... None of these works of Beauvoir fit into very clear categories. So the novels are philosophical... The philosophy involves a lot of examples. The autobiography itself is a literary work, not simply a recounting. And I, for me, it's uh, probably the most uh, successful 
It's always a compromise, so that it's not a good word, compromise. Synthesis, that's a better word, of the literary, the philosophical and the personal. <coughs> Margaret Atak, the have attitudes changed, Suburba, uh, since I does, particularly in view of the letters uh, which... Uh, letters which were discovered between her and Sartre. Well, I certainly think they've given a much more complex. Can you give a? Can you, without being worried, okay. can you give the, the listeners a taste of what what what's worrying you? Of of the from the letters. Of what's worrying me? Well, maybe not but, worrying you. Worrying it was worrying Christina. You know. Um, <laughs> well, um, it's very. Uh, Beauvoir was very much treated as the little woman in, in a public discourse that was hostile to her, to Sartre, until the letters. And suddenly the letters, one realises that everything she'd said about them exchanging views and uh, was, perfectly, was perfectly true about their lives. So they write to each other at great length about their relationships with other people, about the nights they pass with them. It's very intimate and it's very detailed. And I think there was a level of shock... Um, suddenly they became into, uh, the kind of heroes of les liaisons dangereuses, you know, dangerous liaisons, manipulating uh, at a centre of a web of uh, a web specific of specific things, like they, talk, they wrote in their letters, according to notes, that they, they, they took the virginity of mm -hmm. young girls, they passed girls to one to another, and so on, which is... Which is there you are. So... Um, so people people were definitely shocked and felt that the, that the kind of intimate um, details that they were writing about was was inappropriate. Um, um, well, what they're doing it was inappropriate. Writing about it was a secondary activity, wasn't it? Yes, I suppose so. <laughs> I, I just wanted to add that they weren't doing they weren't taking people's virginity and passing them around all the time. <laughs> no, that, no, that no, was, I didn't say all the time. <laughs> no, no, but that's one example of that. There's one example. It's your notes, I'm calling. I know, calling it. but that's one example. <laughs> Otherwise, they were quite serious relationships, but they were multiple. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's right. I think I'd also add that you know Beauvoir and, and Sartre are probably the sort of um, the first sort of intellectuals in the kind of floodlights really and their lives have been heavily heavily scrutinized by all sides of the political spectrum and very harshly judged um you think over harshly judged i think so and i also think that you know celebrities of all stripes attract all sorts of people towards them for all sorts of really spurious motives so um i think Beauvoir recognized at the end of her life they had certainly made some you know serious mistakes in terms of the relationships they'd had with with younger adults um, but yes, but but also younger adults, right? it was yeah. younger adults. Yes. It wasn't young girls. Um, and but 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 also I think that they draw they drew people to them. Good. That's uh, we'll continue that sometime probably after the. That's it. Thank you very much to Margaret Aitak, Ursula Tid and Christina Howells. Next week we'll be talking about the Empire of Mali in the 14th century. One of its emperors, Mansa Musa, was the richest man the world has ever known. Thank you for listening. And the In Our Time podcast gets some extra time now with a few minutes of bonus material from Melvin and his guests. So we're now, you're broadcasting in a different way now. It went very fast, didn't it? <laughs> it did. It seems Goodness to get faster. Yes, yes, there you are. Yes. I had to decide about old age and... and, sure. and then no, there wasn't Because I was confused, I confused... In, I, I, the question was confused. You picked it up very nicely for me, so between autobiography and letters. Uh, yes, I know, I tried. Uh, <laughs> I, I just... I, I wanted to jump old age, but I was thinking... You so did want autobiography, though, didn't you? I, I was, did, yes. yes. I thought you yeah, did. I Otherwise, just, yes, it, I absolutely I think did, it's yeah. really good that you mentioned it because, you know, that whole project of witnessing her life and witnessing the century is really important. It's why... A lot of people read Beauvoir and still do read Beauvoir. You know, how did this great intellectual icon, a feminist icon, how did she actually live? And mm. that's yeah. what pe turns yeah. people towards her letters and autobiographies. I yeah. didn't really get to the legacy either, which has annoyed me. Yes, because a, a big chronicler. She's, yeah. a, she's yeah. a, a fantastic chronicler of the 20th century. Yeah. And you go back and you reread what she was mm. writing about Algeria mm. or her essays, her journalism. Mm. Oh, it's just fantastically sharp. Um, but she's also a magnificent writer. Yeah. I think that's why she's still read. You can pick up what she wrote for Audi. You can pick up her, the, the, the letter in Le Monde in 1960 announcing the torture of this girl on trial. Mm. I mean, she really is very really young, isn't she? Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's an extraordinary letter. Her command of, of polemic and rhetoric is is just magnificent and I think that's why kind of mm. one gets straight back into it mm. yeah mm. yeah she's a huge public intellectual of the 20th century so it's mm. uh, very good that we've done this program what about your students and if you how do they take to her mm. oh they love her they love it mm. yes they love it they enjoy comparing the life and the 
the fiction. Um, they love the feminism, of mm. course. They they don't. Well, some of the second sex is actually on our first year syllabus. It's very nice having Beauvoir on it, and so they might want to do her later on. And I think they find it quite invigorating. The, mm. the, the the male students also enjoy it mm. when they yeah. when they've chosen it. Mm. And I think the funny thing about that book, The Second Sex, is that although it's written so long ago, over 50 years ago, it's still an eye-opener, really. Some of the things in there are things that we still don't talk about. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yes. the whole idea of... It, it's quite delicately balanced, really, about construction. I was thinking this very difficult question, you know, how free are we and so on how much we construct ourselves and applying that existential question to the question of gender. Mm. I mean, that seems yeah. that's her main contribution mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. She applies existentialism to questions that Sartre certainly hadn't reflected on, although she gets him to reflect on them later. Mm -hmm. So in late interviews, she actually makes Sartre say <laughs> that um, the feminist struggle is yeah. more important than the working class struggle. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't think... And, and I don't think, to, well, I think whether he really thought it, I don't yeah. know. Well, for so long, you know, including at the end of the second text, Beauvoir you know, puts her hope in socialism, of yes. course, mm -hmm. and then she yes. realises that socialism isn't going to change women's situation very much. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think yeah. we... I, I've, I think I sort of... We didn't we didn't I didn't n not not that I could nail it but did you think we got it across clearly enough about existentialism what it meant to her because I I felt that I rushed her at all. I think some I of the know. concepts you know I mean, it's really difficult say, because, really. because it's yeah. terribly complicated I know. and you could do a whole mm. program yeah. <laughs> I I felt mean, like plodding the, plodding the thing the, is on uh, level and so yes. it's, it's so I think we did take you know yeah. some of the concepts like the other and being in the world and freedom and no nature mm. and I think those are just such essential building blocks mm. but you could do a whole program you know mm. I do I reckon <laughs> it's on, a huge life and, and the kind of concept shift and change and morph, don't they, uh, over the arc of the lives? So. Yeah. yeah. Who'd like tea? Who'd like coffee? This is the announcement that of the morning. That is the announcement. Okay. <laughs> uh, right. We have it on the tables outside on the okay, street. Okay, that's thank appropriate. you very much. Yeah. There are many more philosophy and discussion programmes from Radio 4 to download for free. Find these on the website at bbc.co.uk slash radio 4.